Salt Lake City, Utah, settled July 24, 1847, by Brigham Young and thousands of weary Mormon pioneers, filling the Salt Lake Valley, as if it were, by a flood of people escaping religious persecution and blazing new trails of hope, innovation, and industry. The peace of the valley hardly broken by the song of meadowlarks. But not far behind the incoming march of soldiers, the sooty din of the railroad, and then the ore smelters of the new century, a strange new flood. The flood of rock and roll. 1983 marked a new chapter in the Salt Lake Valley's history when record snowfall led to record flooding. Little did the valley's peaceful inhabitants know that a new flood blazed on the horizon like molten metal. This force of nature's name, Rick Jackson. You know, people like Rick Jackson. Uncle Rick out. would be proud. Yes, Rick Jackson. Wow. Rick Jackson. Rest in peace, Rick Jackson. Yeah. My name is Suzanne Jackson, and my husband was Rick Jackson. Whose music may be loud, but their message is perfectly clear, and Utah teens are listening. Are you ready to The Jack, a five-man music machine that rocks the Salt Lake Valley with a heavy metal sound that's very much their own. I would say the, the audience is, is teens, a lot of little girls, you know, teenage girls. I think that we appeal because we're a good-looking band. And uh, when we go out and we rock, we put all of our energy into it. Before the concert, the boys in the band pace back and forth like caged animals. The energy level is very high. When it's time to go on, it's a blast. I, I, there's nothing better than, than performing. I, I enjoy it. The band enjoys it. When you're up there, we're on top of the world. me portrayed to an audience trying to get a message across to be yourself and enjoy yourself so it's a hard scene to to uh, do anything with music i think that everybody's so reserved and we're in our own little world the musicians are definitely different because they don't try to venture out of state to see what's going on. We're kind of behind our times a little bit, maybe a couple of years. It's picking up, though. They're about, they're about the best band in the state right now. With one album and an experimental music video under their belt, the group has high hopes for the future. A new album and video are planned to hit the streets sometime this summer. But being in the band is not as glamorous as you might think. Jack manager Richard Reese explains. It's tough. It, uh, lately especially, because we, we work a lot of local gigs to pay a lot of the bills because it all gets dumped back into the project. There's more to being in a band than drugs, sex, and, and uh, having fun. 
it's, it, there's a lot more work to it than uh, nobody thinks. We make a lot of money and it goes it, right back into projects. We always end up starving. But I have this, the right people in the band where they're willing to do that. We all work day jobs. What, what do you do? I work at a drugstore. <laughs> Jack is going to go national this year. Simple as that. We're going to hopefully get a distribution deal, if not a record deal. Having decided to go underground for the next couple of months, the band will attempt to take the jump to Los Angeles in an effort to get picked up nationally. But going underground does not mean the end of the Jack in Salt Lake City. Just the beginning of their next step up the ladder to musical success. TV News, I'm John Butts. He was actually born in Twila and raised in Twila. He was marching band president. He was a band so. geek. He played um, drums um, and trumpet. He was an excellent trumpet player. He actually had a history of playing the trumpet all through his young adult life and won the Reno Jazz Festival when he was 16 with all the jazz players. Like we were saying, we got Jake here with Metallic Blue Records. Jake and his brother and the effort they're doing with Metallic Blue Records is basically pulling out some of the best stuff from the archives and the history of the Salt Lake music scene. So what great timing. Yeah. And with that said, why don't you say a few Sorry, things? Uh, um, just two days ago we signed Mannequin. Man, oh, that's what I've been waiting for, yes! <laughs> and, and, and the part that's amazing about the Mannequin one is they had two albums. Everybody only knows about the one. Yeah, I know about they both. They recorded the second one, never released it. We're putting Are that one out. Are you shitting Yeah, it's going to be sweet. Yes. Uncle Rick proud. would be proud. Mannequin? Well, he played with Kenny Martinez in Mannequin. Um, that was years ago. So I would say 70s, early 80s. Yes, he Rick. Oh my God! Both Jack albums are coming out. Rest in peace, yes. Rick Jackson. And um, Meg Attack. That, that one's coming. How out, did you so. manage that? That Megatech? was the, that was. How did you have to wrestle? Who did you have to wrestle? That was the hardest. Who <laughs> did you have to I wrestle? Had, I called everyone. Um, moved on to Ragdolls. Got into Meg Attack. He did the Jack. Did a video that used to be on music television every Friday night. So, what kind video of fun. Was that? Um, it was one of their songs that he played with Mark Morrison and I think Chris Guido was the drum player and um, Brian Bennell. Oh, I mean, we all stuff. over the place and it's been, it's been awesome, it's been a great journey. And I'll be honest, that's part of the fun. I'll, I'll be honest, the, yeah, the, the most journey. fun is, is the journey, meeting with you guys, finding out about the backstories, the stories that nobody ever hears, some of the stuff that yeah, can't go into he, print he digs is out, awesome. He uh, digs out some of the coolest stuff from people. Uh, the, our meeting that we had for the the Harlot Vamp stuff was like one of the funnest times I think I've had. Right? Yeah. yeah, it was <laughs> awesome. It was fun. Traveling back in time and seeing everybody yeah. smile and you know, go down that memory lane. And so it's, it's awesome. Then to go up and do interviews like this. We're um, going out to Vegas next week to do a music video out there for one of our upcoming artists. Uh, so Utah cool. Bay is a big yeah. doing out there. So it's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, he did um, try to get signed with. Um, he was actually signed with Megatac, and then Armored Saint wanted him to go with them, and that caused an issue because he was already signed, so... Do you remember what label it was? I think it was CBS Records. Wow. Yeah, because uh, Armored Saint was, uh, and one of the guys that wanted him to play was doing a, a was involved with a Disney label, so, and he couldn't move over because of that. Um, as far as I know, um, that Craig Sorensen and Parrish Holtquist decided they wanted to start, start a super group in town and they, they shopped around quite a while and they wound up uh, asking Rick Jackson to leave the Jack and come front Meg Attack. Then they added uh, my buddy Jake Oslo, great guitarist and uh, Pat Carter to round out the lineup. But yeah, they, they just had everything. They had the sound, the looks, uh, the attitude, the girls. You know, they, they were just phenomenal. They were a great band to watch live. Well, I, I, I started playing in Obsession, and while I was in Obsession, um, incidentally, they're all still alive, and, and we're all still good friends. But 
we'd go out and watch other Utah bands play and, you know, bands like Mannequin, The Jack, you know, people like Rick Jackson, Chris Clary, Gilbert Rodriguez, some of Utah's finest musicians. And I remember just watching them going, man, one day I want to be in that caliber. And then, you know, as times progress and bands progress, you had bands break up, put a new band together. I um, formed Vice with Mark Morrison, who used to play for the Jack with Rick Jackson. Um, and so me, Rick, and the keyboardist from Obsession put Vice together. And Vice was having some good success out here. Uh, had just barely got our demo cut when some of the members from Megatac approached me and said, hey, this is what we're doing. Are you interested in being part of it? And they told me that Rick Jackson was going to front the band. And, you know, at that moment, I said, that's it, I'm done. I went in and told the guys in Vice that I was finished and I was playing with Rick Jackson and out the door I went. Yeah, yeah, um, I don't know how much rotation was going on, but I remember Rick Jackson always, always handled our radio ads and I'm pretty sure it was with, with KD. Rick was always big, no, nah, we're gonna advertise, we're not gonna do it. Well, I remember, you know, the first time I heard heard the name of the band Megatac come out over the radio, I was like, Megatac, tap, 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 and was like, whoa, man, pull over the car, that was so fucking cool, man. I, my head went, woo -hoo. I was a rock star. Right then and there, for that one minute, I was a rock star. It was pretty cool. I decided I was going to go back to my roots, and I started a band with Rick Jackson. Ah, yeah. <laughs> and we did that whole Asphalt Jungle thing. That thing was so fun. And then Downfall, which just, it, it, there's, it, it, it speaks for itself. That's probably one of the best bands I think I've ever done. It, probably because I was a good troll the whole time. <laughs> That's probably why I think that way. <laughs> and I think the band actually took a little different direction than you've done on your other ones. Oh, uh, absolutely, it, 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 yeah. I mean, I'm not going to call it like dark, you're not going to put evil listen to it, but man, it has some it's ambience very, to it. I really, really Yeah, like very it. emotional, very, it, it, uh, what did they call that? That They call it, I guess, new metal, but, but it had that industrial edge over that metal sound. And it was like, it, a lot of fun. We always had samples under our stuff and it's the first band I know of that I've ever seen tour with inner monitors with backing tracks and yeah so that and then after that well no actually even after that or during the middle of that that's when Mike and I got together and got Ariel back up off the ground and what do you guys think makes the Salt Lake music scene uh, special and unique you know, this is one thing that I've noticed from the beginning to the end of where we're at right now, not to the end of the scene, but I mean to where we're at right now, is there's a lot of camaraderie that you don't see in a lot of other scenes. You see a lot more, you know, and, and there is a bit of it between bands and stuff, but... Great camaraderie. But in, great this, in this town, I mean... A lot of love. Like with the Jack, Rick Jackson, and then uh, Kenny Martinez. Kenny Martinez used to come to all of our shows, and he would always just, dude, I think you could work on this. I think, you, and you know, he was kind of like the guy that Rick was. <laughs> Rick was my mentor, by the way. Yeah, he and, was my and, guy. And he Kenny was kind of so mine. It, and that's what's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I, I miss them. I miss them both. But yes, yeah. it, it, and he used to. Just all the time, go out of his way to make sure. Hey, I noticed Dude, this Manica, about are your you playing. Me? It's, <laughs> gonna be, it's gonna be awesome. And, and the nice thing, that, and I'm speaking from a non-musician standpoint. Um, when I watch you guys, and when I interview you guys, and I talk to you guys, there's no bad mouthing other bands. Now, yeah. th there's inspiring and wanting to overdo this. We want to. We want to. Yeah, of course. But, but never tear no, anybody healthy, down. Yeah, no. healthy no, criticism and. It, it, like, that's gotta be. I tell, like I said, I've told scenes. this story about Kurt and I 
for years how there was never any animosity. I watched Kurt. I would be up there on the front of the stage watching him when he would get off into his weird solos, just doing <laughs> weird shit. Weird stuff, yeah. And I watched what he'd wear on stage. This guy was already on the stage. I was just breaking into the scene. And it was guys like Rick Jackson and Gilbert Rodriguez that gave him oh, my hey, shows. Gilbert, yeah. um, Dizzy Bitch, those were my first opening gigs, you know. But I think Kurt the was the dude I that I was played. watching. He had the coolest clothes. <laughs> <laughs> His band was super cool. Oh, they had so great funny. material. That is really good. You know, it, it is it is what it is, and it's like it's so exciting that here we are, almost forty years later. He's my guy. I love the fact when I'm on stage, I look over stage right, and I look at Kurt and Rand. And uh, Ben, or I mean Randy and Ben, oh, they're just flipping their hair, and Ellie or <laughs> Kurt and myself, and we're just like watching, but we don't watch our feet. <laughs> 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 oh my god! So it's so fun. I again, I just love this band. I couldn't be happier. That band Truce, they called Truce and Blood. Now, but back then they were called Truce, and they they were the first band to actually play in the store. They played in our back room, and then we moved to Sugar House. Didn't do, uh, yeah, it wasn't as big up there either to do shit. Well, it's not that big here either, but we still do them. Um, and then, yeah, I've sold a lot, of, a lot of local bands' music over the years too. Lots of tapes, mm -hmm. and then CDs, and now, now people are, you know, they're putting their stuff on record now again. I think that's one of the biggest things that this valley has given over a lot of other scenes is that we do support each other. <laughs> we really do. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, exciting. It's totally a bro brotherhood. I mean, yeah. you guys have always been my, my brothers. I s it, you know, it still exists today. Oh, a lot yeah, of the bands, so, you know, they're, they're, we might not be the most popular band in town, you know, because you got great my bands like bullshit. American <laughs> Hitman and Ginger and the Gents <laughs> and you yeah. know, other bands that are really tight and they're getting the crowd crazy. They, you know, the support is there. And it, so the music scene is still thriving, let's just say. In this, it's starting this to pick back in. up finally after Kurt, this Kurt, by the way, is a sound man, so he knows what's oh, going yeah, on. Oh, yeah, I've, I've got my finger on the pulse. The world, I don't think most of the world realizes what a, what a, uh, it was a phenomenal music scene here in Salt Lake City. And, and it wasn't just, you know, Salt Lake City, you know, we're talking Bountiful and Ogden and, but Salt Lake City had a had a music scene that was it was insane. I mean, half the time you damn near feel like you're in L.A. You know, lots of bands. But anyways, um, I was saying that um, Utah. Well, we'll say with Salt Lake, there were so many bands, but they weren't just run of the mill bands. I mean, there were so many really, really good bands. And, and so it was never an issue to pair up with any one of the bands or pair up with any two of the bands and, and guarantee a good night somewhere because it, all the bands were solid. And um, there wasn't a whole lot of band rivalry that I remember. Everybody was, you know, People weren't worried about who's going to headline and who's doing this and da da da. da. It's like, look, we're going to do three, three nights in a row with with you guys, and we'll headline this night. You guys headline the next night, da da da. And, and it was, I just remember it being really awesome. And my God, the fan base was insane. It was never a dead night, and the fans were loyal. Real one. I was uh, initially I started in a band called Trolls that was back I think around 85, 86. We played uh, a few shows with Circus and an old band called Hostile. We wasn't active very long. Uh, we played mostly uh, we had some beer kegs at the the Sheriff's Posse out in South Jordan. Um, I left the band and I moved away for a while. When I returned, I uh, joined a band called Richter. That was kind of short-lived. And then I uh, played in a band called Lofton with Rod Lofton using the name Scott Kelly. I formed Kelly Rocks. So we went through several lineups over the years. Um, we 
one of the most interesting shows that we played was probably someplace no band has ever played before, and that's at the rooftop of LDS Hospital. Tell us about that gig. How did you get that? Okay. So my singer, Buddy Morgan, who's going to be si who's singing with the Good Shepherd also, he was in a severe car accident. Um, he was never going to walk again, never going to sing. About what year was this? This was, n this was 2000, okay, by the time this lineup. And so he had his accident. And so anyways, as he started to recover, he told them that he was a singer, he, all the staff there. And they says, well, why don't you have uh, your band come in and play for us or play for the, the rehab patients in here? So we did that and we had all the local news stations there. It was pretty cool. And then after we played that, um, the staff decided they wanted us to have, have us play their annual summer barbecue on top of the roof. So it was really cool. It was kind of like the Beatles, you know. <laughs> My name is Miss Jamie Polis, and I'm the owner and founder of Evanston Staging and Events. I am a band manager and promoter. Tell the story about the, uh, the DeJoria uh, concert that you did, because that's where you and I met. Yes. The DeJoria Center. Um, tell the story of how that all came together. So, um, that one was a lot of fun. We had, so I, I got with the, I just had an idea um, that uh, uh, we should do, you know, this fundraiser for the Utah Food Bank. And I think it was with As Is. And um, so um, it went from a small show to a bigger show to a bigger venue. And we had the TV advertisement. We all had the, the interview on TV. That was fun. And then we all hung our, our our posters out. We did what we could to promote it. Um, we got on every social media we could think of to get that thing promoted. Um, so we had this huge 3,000 people show going on in Park City at the DeJora Center and we brought, I can't remember, it was like, I think it was seven bands that we had that came. Yeah, that was that was pretty amazing. We raised an entire uh, food truck full of food for them, so that was pretty. That was a good night. That was pretty astounding. But within that time frame, I started getting more likes on my page. Um, so the word w had spread more, and because of all the advertising and promotion that we were doing, um, you know, with like Slug Magazine and everything. Um, I, I think that that brought a lot more interest to things. I got a personal interview with the Park Record out of Park City. Scott Iwasaki did that. I think it really got more interest in, in what I do. So, and, the, and I, I think I got, um, you know, a lot more interest from those bands because I've had a lot more shows with them guys. I think that it's sad in such a conservative state that these bands, because I've, I fight for them guys, there's so much talent here, there's so much, and, I, and every time I hear of, of you know, a concert or a performance or something at one of the city parks or downtown or something, you know, everybody, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I, I love all kinds of music. But um, there's never, hey, what about metal? And I'll put on their messages or email them, hey, you know, what about this metal band? Um, I think that they need to be included in some of these things. And so every chance I get, I think that I go to bat for our metal musicians that need to be recognized as 
real musicians and real people and you know like I said they have real lives and I still think that that's a stigma anywhere and everywhere you go. MetallicBlueRecords.com like I say they're um, doing a lot of great things for a lot of great local bands. The Tools, we've got Strider, Bad Boys, am I right? Yeah, we got Bad, Brixton, Bad Circus, the Take. The take. The take. Uh, so in fact, bikes. this this interview couldn't have been planned better because <laughs> of him showing up. We're just right now in and the now middle of re-releasing the Vamp and Harlot stuff that I was involved with, which is uh, what coming out like in a month, in two? About, <laughs> about uh, probably about eight weeks out. About, about eight weeks, so about two months out. That's what we're looking at. That's uh, something I'm really excited for. We we took and took the old uh, two inch tapes and remastered them, put them to digital. Randy, my son, actually mixed the whole thing, which is really cool. On those new track or the the stuff we got off the two inch tape, turned out amazing. <laughs> Randy's a whole nother chapter. Yeah, Randy we don't have enough. Whole... <laughs> we don't have enough time <laughs> yes, to talk about kid. the love we have for Randy. Uh, yeah, we we, we made history. We yeah. just made history yeah. in the state of Utah. The fact is, he was playing with us. We had gigs. We were in demand for opening up for national bands, touring bands, established, signed rock and roll artists, our That's heroes. And um, history here. we Holy wanted cow. to do these shows. We didn't want to leave Randy home because he wasn't old enough to get into the bars. So we created, I refused. <laughs> we created what we called Randy Cam, which yes. would consist of a two-way video send, receive from I the stage. I still have a box of all the BNC connectors to make <laughs> the Randy Cam. And it says right on it, Randy Cam parts. Right so on yeah, we, <laughs> Mark Cobell, I think, featured us on Channel 2 yep. News. It was yeah. a great story. Yeah, Mark Cobell did that. Big story on yeah. Randy. Yep. Entertainers live for the stage and they feed off the audience, but this story is a little bit different. Yeah, for Randy Johnson, there is no stage and there is no audience, but he still performs and he knocks them dead every night. Local heavy metal group Ariel is setting up for another gig here at Club Vegas. And while they move the gear inside to the stage, Lead guitar player Randy Johnson is setting up here in the family RV outside in the parking lot. The other guys in the band, including Randy's guitar playing dad, say that's a drag. It's not right. It, it just it, it doesn't feel right. It just it's because I mean even in our writing process, he does 50% of the writing. He's he's the main contributor, so it's not right not having him. But we're getting the next best thing. Yeah. I'm out here playing, you know, having fun, trying to do the best I can trying to beat the system as much as possible to be able to play and follow my dream. The isolation has nothing to do with Randy's playing. One listen and you know this kid has the goods. My dad, he's been playing in bands for 30 years. He's by far my favorite guitarist I've ever seen. And I just thought it was the coolest thing on the face of the planet. So he bought me a guitar. I learned. You see, Randy is only 14 years old and by state law. Playing inside this bar is off limits. So lead singer Mike Hernandez says the band had to get creative. We love having him with us. He's definitely 100% part of the band. However, his age doesn't allow, and we just don't see it necessary to leave him at home anymore. So we have the technology. We have the technology, that's right. So while the sound guys tweak the stage and get ready for the gig, Randy tunes up in the RV. His image will be sent to the stage by camera, and the stage camera will send his bandmates and the crowd back into the RV. Not perfect, but it works. I have the video of half the stage and half the audience, so I can kind of interact with everybody without having to be there. And Dad wouldn't have it any other way. So who's the better guitar player? <laughs> hey, right now it's neck and neck. <laughs> I give I give him another two years, and I'm going to be just thrown out of the band. There's no need for me. Are you better than him now? No way. Not possible. Some people say you are. I doubt it. Oh. Yeah. That's creative. Hey, so he plays in the RV. And there's, it's a Utah law. Is this the law yeah. nationwide? That no, in fact, when they go to Montana, he can actually go in a club and play. And, and in other states, you can get a permit to go in a club and play if you're underage. But in Salt Lake County, in Utah, liquor laws don't allow anybody that young to be inside of a bar. So he plays outside. <laughs> He 
it, it it worked out. He was outside. He was performing with a camera on him, send a feed into the bar onto a white screen the so the bar could yeah. see him performing. And uh, in fact, he had people outside watching his performance, supporting him. Yeah. And we had to do what we had to do. He was in the back of a truck at one time. Carmine Apiece was out there. Yeah, Carmine Apiece. Yeah, from Honestly, uh, Michael was, Shanker Group, Lynch yeah. Mob. And that was really neat to see the that support we cool. got from the touring uh, and, bands. And what was cool is years after running into Carmine at the NAMM show and remembering Randy, he's like, you're the one who played. And he totally remembers Randy, probably to this day. That's our boy. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, great little story. Randy would have been maybe, what, 12 years old? 13, yeah, about maybe. 12, 12, 13. And I sent him, I got him an e, uh, MP3 file of the song. Two weeks later, he says, I'm ready. And I'm like, are you serious? I've known dudes my own age that I'll give them a, a song, and yeah. they'll take months to learn the song. This little kid, it's been, it's been such, <laughs> such an honor and such a privilege. It makes me melt. It cheers me like me. I can't even explain how excited I get that I've watched him grow up since that moment to, yeah, to yeah. today where he's with me on stage. And, 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 and they're big monumental moments. I mean, oh you, so I think it was 2009 was the first time he got up on stage with you guys, which was absolutely beautiful. And I'll be honest, I think he was under 12. Uh, and I want to say awesome. eight, dude. Yeah, I think he was. No, no, the first time we performed, he was eight. With you and, and that was, uh, that was No, Harlan. no, no, no. It was a Downfall. Downfall. And it was I mean, in, downfall. In, in, in Wyoming. That was the first time Randy performed ever. On stage. That's right. He was <laughs> eight, and I've seen him play yeah. with you at the uh, uh, the Junction Theater. It, 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 the, the Sandy Bell. Amphitheater. The Sandy Amphitheater is the, where we did oh, the I, next show. And at that point, I think Randy was still like nine years old. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I approached <laughs> Kurt and Joe, and I said... He got Randy a killer uh, guitar contract. <laughs> no, I said, let me, <laughs> let, let me manage his career. I said, non-exclusive. I said, just let me manage his career. I'll negotiate his endorsement bills. <laughs> and I swear, I went after, I got him drive amps, drive guitars, guitar, switch yep. guitars. Switch, yep. we, we managed to get him later on Clayton Picks and then Vengeance yeah, Guitars, guitars which guitars built him his own yeah, signature custom, custom build, <laughs> which was destroyed in a car accident, by the way, to the NAMM show one year. All of these guys yeah, were we lucky got, to be alive. We got building. rear ended by a Mustang doing 75 miles an hour and we were stopped. Oh. Shit was scattered. Yeah, yard sale. Yard sale in Riverside, thing. like San Bernardino. <laughs> he calls me a fork. Like, you got to get me This is quite, quite an insane story. The, the firefighters showed up to, you know, they normally, usually the firefighters are the worst, ones on, worst ones on the scene. They walked up and, like, so where are the bodies? That's straight up what they said. Where are the bodies? And I'm like, it's the four of us right here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it was crazy as hell. And they and they took us. We got to ride in their fire trucks and stuff back to the. That's and awesome. They, they brought they brought the car, and, and they, 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 like covered the whole thing. Brought the car to the fire station so we could clean out all the stuff we needed because our amps and guitars and stuff. What was left of them, oddly enough. The one guitar that was destroyed was Randy's Vengeance. It was probably the best Vengeance ever made. <laughs> that was the one guitar that was destroyed. But in fact, there's a great picture that turned out the other night from the show. Maybe you guys can include yeah, that. Yeah, I was going to say, that from playing the, just the last show we played with Ariel on Friday night, there's a photo of Randy and I, and it's just mm -hmm. like, this wow. is why I keep doing this. Mm -hmm. it, there's nothing like being able to jam with... You know your offspring for one but also somebody you've helped and pushed in their own direction you know there's and, and if you don't mind me saying i actually see you, you guys see up that on stage and i see him push you into oh absolutely and he inspires and pushes you and i think that's great it's yeah, a cool no, we'll throw it in the post. post yeah please do it's a as yeah it's a great photo yeah it, it, it and then that's and that's another thing He's gotten so damn good that he's pushing me now <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> I would have to go to Las Vegas, and we were performing at a place called The Underworld in Las Vegas. And for some reason, were you running late? You, you didn't make it to Gates. And so that was actually Randy's first performance as a single guitar player. 
with Ariel. Do you remember that at all? That was, was that in Vegas? I thought that, that was, was in Las Vegas. You were late for some reason back at the hotel, some shit. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah I, I do remember he had to do the first half of the he set got by it, himself. Got through yeah. it and killed it. And he did. <laughs> he killed it. That, that From that point on, I knew he had it. He could well, cover so. anything. <laughs> and that was kind of the turning point where we actually saw him take and step up mm-hmm. center stage as opposed to in his own father's shadows. He knew. I've only missed one other gig, and I was sicker than even. Oh, I've had one of those. I've had a show where yeah, I didn't show I, up. I, I, only one other show that I've missed even a part of. And that I was so sick. And it was an aerial gig. Oddly enough, it uh, the, the biker bar, uh, Barbary Coast. Barbary Coast. So which one? So that would have been the one Randy. With Randy yeah, where Randy covered the whole thing by himself. And he Randy it. even came by. I remember. Just that. to make sure, that, you know, like <laughs> and I'm like, dude, I am sick as hell. He watched me throw up twice. He's like, great. You need to stay home, and I'll <laughs> take care of this. Such a good kid. <laughs> Love I, him. Like I said, I, there, there's nothing better to know that you've got somebody like that in your back pocket. You're, they're just going to cover your ass and you know they're going to be there. That's the best thing I think that jamming with family is. And that's what, why Ariel's so special. Because we've turned the whole thing into a family. Oh, yeah. no, <laughs> you know? we, it's, so, it's just exciting to even get together for rehearsals. It is. It's always great. <laughs> World famous, the Heavy Metal Shop, considered to be a mecca for metalheads around the world, opened in 1987 by its owner and creator, Kevin Kirk, the Heavy Metal Shop has been a highly sought after destination for touring musicians as well as a prime spot for local musicians to promote their music and shows. And I, I actually saved my money cutting meat. I was a meat, man, meat department manager and I saved my bonus money to open my store in 86, so I quit in 86 to do that, save my, you know, use that money, and then didn't cut meat for 20 years. Well, your first location was where? And Sandy. Wow. Sandy. Nine, yeah, 9400 South. And I actually wanted the, the, the location, that we, our second location was, the, was where I really wanted to be originally. And Blue Boutique was opening around the same time, and they got that spot. And so I had a real estate broker tell me, you know, out in Sandy, there was a lot of people out there, and he got me into a place. Had a two-year lease, and then Blue Boutique moved up the street in two years. They had a two-year lease, so it was the timing was perfect What's to move in. Time? That was in Sugar House. That was in '89, okay. so we moved up there in '89. It's almost exactly two years. Two years so later. Twelve years. Ten years in that spot, and then we moved up to the Redmond Building for two years. That was, we had Slayer painted up in, in flames up above the sign, <laughs> which is real funny to look at that now thinking about, because it was kind of conservative in, in Sugar House. It was the, all the furniture stores, and, and there we were in, you know, Slayer in flames. And, anyway, it's just funny to me. That's awesome. What year did you get to downtown Salt Lake location? I moved down here May of 2001. So, tw- yeah, 20 years. What put you on the map? Well, I think uh, Slayer had a lot to do with it. Because they, they wore our, they, they were like one of the first bands to wear heavy metal shop clothing. Showed up in magazines and um, there were some other bands too. Dark Angel was one. Uh, and I think that's that was the beginning of that. And then a lot of bands since then have worn stuff. But the, you know, all those photos of Slayer are still around, you know, the, either on the internet or all the old magazines. And there's some videos. He did. He did. That was awesome. Yeah. (laughs) He wore it on the news here. And I actually, they started the tour here. It was Operation Rock and Roll in 1991. It was at Motorhead, Judas Priest, um, Alice Cooper, uh, Metal Church, and Dangerous Toys. And so I got to talk to Alice the day before and gave gave him a shirt. And then at the show, I got to go back and talk to him and he... He told me, yeah, I wore your shirt on the news tonight, so I had to track it down. Yeah, so awesome. I love Alice. So. <laughs> That's probably one of the coolest things of all these years. From what you know, what's the furthest that someone's come to visit the shop? Oh, geez. Well, there's, you know, European metal bands. Uh, guys from Watain came in. Yeah. Were they from Norway, I think? I'm not sure. They're 
far away. Um, guys from, let's see, Helsinki, guys from Helsinki. Uh, uh, can't, I'm trying to think of the uh, 69 eyes. Uh, I can't think, Amorphous, those guys came in. So I guess that'd probably be the farthest, but I've had people from all over, really, you know, Mexico, which isn't that far, but Mexico City had some, had a girl in here a couple weeks ago. What's their they, reaction when they come in? They love it, yeah. Yeah, most people love it when they come in, and they're just, I love that, too. It makes me happy, too. Those are the best. Uh, yeah, and it's kind of funny and sad, too. I mean, we had just intoxicated, had a Native American guy come in, and I've, I've got a lot of Native American customers that, it's one of my best customers, but this guy, he was very intoxicated, came in and he said this was his land, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, well, I pay the rent, <laughs> you know, so that was kind of funny, um, but I've got, yeah, I've got, Native Americans are way into metal music, and they're uh, some of my best customers. I've even been been asked if I was Native. Really? They've talked to me and they felt like I was Native too, so, yeah, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't even look Native, but. Where did the name uh, just in my mind, just, yeah, yeah, sounded like a good name. In fact, the guy that designed the logo, he was one of my old customers that was more into jazz and more, he was more of a conservative guy, and he was a uh, graphic designer, and he uh, asked me if I ever needed, needed a logo, you know, to, you know, and so I asked him about it, and he actually drew up a logo with half a record instead of a skull, with the same lettering, and it was, it was written out the long way. And then he did it, did it that you know the way of the logo, and then I told him I needed skulls or blood or something, um, you know, to make it metal. And he wasn't really a metal guy, so he was like, "You sure?" I'm like, yes, yeah, you know, something like that. So he came back with the half skull, which was perfect. And it's you know you could see it, you know, from far away. You knew what it was. Right. It's been you know cool. Like when when uh, people have come in, I wasn't expecting, you know, uh, Ryan Adams came in, and that I wasn't Ryan Adams. A, Ryan Adams. Brian, okay. he's not as famous as Brian, <laughs> but I, I like Brian. That'd be cool. If Brian Adams came in too. Um, Travis Barker. Uh, oh yes. Yeah, he's been in a couple of times, and he uh, first time he came in, I had no idea that he was coming in. You know, when he came in, and he was very cool. It was awesome. And then the next time, they were on tour, and his manager called me and asked if we could, they could fit a tour bus down this little street. I said, I think so. So they they did parked out here, and then Travis came in with his kids and. Bought him um, metal shop sh t-shirts, and, and then he bought that Murder in the Front Row book about the Bay Area thrash, thrash scene. So that was cool. And then some of the in stores. I mean, we had Rob Halford in the store when he was in Fight. So that was a, that was a big moment too for the heavy metal show. That was like one of the coolest too to have him Where's in the show. Sugar that was Sugar House. So that would have been '92, I think. So it was the first Fight record. When Iron Maiden comes to town, it's huge, and it's like it's like Christmas time in here. It, it, seriously, like business. Uh, the the day before, the day of, and the day after is like you know, people come from all over. I mean, that's that, this is a great you know Salt Lake's a great metal city, it really is. I sell a lot of Maiden anyway, but knowing if they're coming to town, I really stock up. Um, yeah, those are those are our people. That's like <laughs> I love. You know, I, I love it. And, you know, I remember in the beginning, it was always like, you know, radio stations, you know, K-Bear, because they were new at the time, too. And, you know, they wanted, you know, we buy ads and it was like, it was it was a lot of money, really expensive for radio. And uh, when Z, you remember when Z-Rock was here? When they came here and Gene that was running that, it was syndicated from Texas. But it was, I mean, they played the stuff that... And I remember him. I remember him coming out to my Sandy store, and I'd already dealt with K Bear. I was like, "That's a lot of money. I can't afford to do that." And this is, you know, this is before Slayer was wearing the stuff. This is before we really had the brand. I pretty much knew everybody that wore the shirts. You know, it was friends and family, and really, you know, diehard customers. But I knew everybody. It wasn't a, wasn't a big thing yet. I had I had T-shirts. I didn't really I didn't have all this other merch. And uh, Gene came in and he's trying to sell me these ads on Xerox, and I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, I don't know." And he goes, "Well." You had to listen to it on an AM radio. So I didn't have that in the shop. So he goes, well, come out, you know, my car and I'll, I'll play it. You know, so he's playing the radio and it's, uh, I think UFO was one of the first things. And then Priest and then it was, I mean, it was stuff like, this is the stuff, this is us. And he goes, I'll tell you what, 
we'll do some ads. And he goes, yeah, I won't charge you anything. And he goes, you start making some money, it works for you. You start paying me what you think it's worth. And he would do remotes from the shop and it'd bring people out. People were listening to Z-Rock, it really worked. And so I started paying him and uh, we had a really great relationship. And that brought that brought a lot of business too. And that was right before we moved to, to uh, Sugar House, like a year before. So that whole year, we kind of build up the name. And then by the time we moved to Sugar House, we had a pretty established name, but it still wasn't the big thing that it was. It was, we were selling more music than shop stuff. And then, uh, and then it was when Slayer started wearing the stuff. When Seasons of the Abyss came out like 1990, and Tom, you know, showed up on the cover of Kerrang! Magazine. That was like the, the first one I saw. And uh, he'd come in the shop and I gave him a shirt and I said, um, you know, wear that on your new album cover. He must be a smart ass. And he says, oh, you'll see it. So the album came out and I, you know, there's no, it's like, oh shit, well. And then I sold Kerrang! Magazine. So I got an order in and I'm opening the box up and I pull them out and there it is around the cover. It's like, that just gave me chills because that was so cool still to this day. And that was just him on his own. It wasn't like, it was him being cool, you know, which is kind of the whole metal, you know, that's how, how it should be. You so know, you're like the, a, it's uh, like a. What was the backlash after? Um, oh, definitely, yeah, definitely selling more shirts. Um, still, what it still took a while though. It wasn't what it is now. I mean, it's it's you know, it takes years, I guess, but it, but it, it it did help a lot. And then you know, then they then we did another in store with them. We did two in stores after that. Um, Tom had a girlfriend that lived here too, so that so he came in with her. That you know, they weren't, Slayer wasn't on tour, and then we did the in stores after that. But I'd met him in LA the previous uh, at Foundations Forum, previous fall, before he came in. So, um, so I think that, that they helped us a lot. You know, there was the glory years in the 90s, and then you know, it's getting back up again. So, but yeah, I, I don't think I don't think that affects us really if what's what's popular like that because metal is always going to be. It's always going to be popular. Timmy Champagne, the highly animated, incredibly talented, revered bass player for the Salt Lake rock band Ariel, has become immortalized in the hearts and minds of the Utah rock scene. Of course. Yeah, our old bass player that passed Jimmy away, was he was quite the performer. <laughs> yeah. And again, that's what's so cool about Ariel, the history that we had. Tim was with us for so many years, and his wife, when he passed away, stepped into his shoes and became our bass player it, she again was a with lot a, of fun to teach and too. yeah it was, it was so that's the thing after 20 some <laughs> years of one guy and he dies you don't just say wendy hey i'll, I'll we'll be in touch we encourage her come out plug yeah. in let's try this shit let's see if you can play any of these songs uh, I, i'll never forget that when we started with and we we, we and did stuff. a lot for her Cause she was fucked up, man. You know, her husband. They yeah, were so yeah. close. And Tim was. Well, my girlfriends would always say, "Why can't you be like Tim?" What do you mean? <laughs> when he sets up his equipment, he goes and hangs out with Wendy, and they hug and kiss. And yeah. me, I'm just wandering, I'm getting them drinks. Being, <laughs> you know? I them being on the Oprah Winfrey show. Oh, of course, show. they were on the Oprah. Oh my God, <laughs> Oprah Winfrey show, age defying makeover. Our bass players, Tim and Wendy. <laughs> I know, Tim and Wendy. Tim and Wendy. They're a rock and roll couple, but rock and roll has even changed in the last 30 years. I know they could look so much younger with one of your makeovers, Oprah. They need help. They need help now. Now, Cindy and Kirk, are you ready to see Wendy's new look? Where are they? There they are, right there, okay. Good, y'all were very candid. <laughs> it's a wonder y'all are still friends after all of that. Remember for the past decade, Wendy has worn her long hair the same way, in a bun with two curly cues. And now she's looking like a rockin' 39-year-old. Coming out. I don't no know what to say. Shy. 
Shy. No more Miss Shy. And you know something? It, in terms of a look, it's not Jennifer Aniston because it's really, it's, it's, it's kind of, I want to do kind of a little red carpet thing and I had everything to work with. We did, uh -huh. the team did. And this soft hair, this is her soft hair. Wow. So now Wendy can do this herself. She can go, use her soft wave or she can dry it straight. She has the body and she's been hiding. I mean, this, this is a hot babe. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so we took Wendy out of the 70s. Yeah. Now, Wendy, when, what do you think of yourself? You're, you, you... I feel young and sexy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Wendy, Wendy has never seen her husband without his long hair. Remember, this is how Tim has looked since 1985. We've kept Tim and Wendy apart since their makeovers began. So you're ready now to see him? Yes. He hasn't seen you, you haven't seen him? Nope. He's a more modern man. He looks a good 15 to 20 years younger, I'm told. I've seen none of the makeovers, so I'm just as shocked as y'all are, really. <laughs> okay, come on out, Tim. cry and then especially the ap after where are they now Wendy yeah she gets to update yeah I'm playing bass with the band I want to I yeah, love these guys she, she went out there and told uh, about the aerial cried story broke out, down yeah. cried about Timmy but Great. she gave us 10 years of her life Great. and we love her to death experience with her when you're in the aerial family you're always in that's, the aerial what I mean. yeah. that's, that's what I mean that's what I mean it's not just a band it's got <laughs> such a great story to tell and the members that I've gone through over the Death years. Death doesn't even take you out. All I was trying to do is keep up with this guy. I built this band, tried to compete with Harlot, and then I just kept finding better players. And uh, it, it, now it here is. I am with not only this guy, but his son. I'm, and now what's really exciting is we're in a new chapter here yeah, with, with um, ben. ben, who's a bass player, who plays with Randy and his band Stormhaven. Yep. And he brings a whole level of energy to the table. Uh, we had a great, we've got a great story as far as bass players. Timmy Champagne, of course, there's no... Absolutely. He was the, the, the story in it, showman. The story in itself <laughs> is, is fun to talk about, but we don't have enough time here. And then that would include Wendy, who was his widow, who also played with us, gave us 10 years of her life and gave it hell. She became a decent bass player and we're so that. proud of her. But, she came um, a long way. Yeah, so, <laughs> in fact, there we had, there were times we had two bass players, and you know, just to kind of have someone carry us. And um, yeah, she was learning. We did need a little bit of help, but people were glad to join the family. <laughs> With the dawn of the 21st century, rock and roll caught a second wind, and discovered a new and younger audience thirsty for heavy guitar chords, thundering drums, and soulful vocals. Salt Lake Rockers As Is was the package deal, drawing crowds in the 90s and sold out venues in this new century. And Frank, Frank bought a bunch of gear just to have at his house for everybody to kind of screw around and, and play with and whatnot. And he thought, you know, why not, uh, why not just get the band back together for one last finalizing show because we never really yeah. had a show that kind of yeah they they kind of didn't have any closure goodbye to everything and so we played that that show at Barbary and two days later Frank was getting phone calls so I think we came back October of 2017 16 16 2016 yep. yeah so here we are a year and a half almost two years later and we're still going strong my voice kind of came to its own when we started back in the 90s with Jamie because he hits the drums so hard that when you're in practice you can't hear yourself so I ended up kind of honing a almost a yell that could get into a, a pretty decent range and I could hold it there so that's where it came from really we ready to go Arnie we're ready are you guys ready tonight 
Man, there's a lot of you people out there. I don't know what to do with myself. But here we fucking go. We are as is. Let me see your hands. Oh, I can start with this. <laughs> yeah, you say, take so this yeah, we both were on the same circuit, her harlot and Ariel. And so I would roll into towns like Spokane, <laughs> Washington, for example, I and the, really the little story. motel that we'd all stay at, all the bands would say. And sure enough, there we are on the checking in at the front desk, and there's a picture of Harlot right there on their <laughs> bulletin board in the front desk. The little lady, a little old couple, they loved Harlot. That's all they would talk about. And how they never caused any trouble. <laughs> I'm like, you yeah, obviously right. don't know them very well. <laughs> but anyway, and so in that, it, this happened constantly. We would be in Idaho Falls, Chicks Lounge. Chicks same, Lounge. That was one of my favorite. Same place. thing. We we got the unlimited fucking bar thing revoked. Oh, my yeah. my band singly. How do you get revoked from Chicks Lounge? It, no, it, uh, unlimited bar tap. Oh, they, of course. They put, they oh put a God. cap on it after our, our first gig there. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah, we, that was fun we, to party. We, we made out. zero dollars on that that first time we went to Chicks Lounge. That'll tell you how much. Tell we them drank. about tell them about when you were following the pet or when you were on the same yeah, side with the say, pads. So, <laughs> It's really funny. We it's actually at Chick's Lounge. Pedestrians, to, of course. Yeah, the Chick's Lounge, to, that's the funniest thing. So the hotel we stayed at was kind of a, what would you call like a Rambler type hotel. And there was like a trampoline out in the front yard of it. And there was it basically... Did like, I think you're thinking of Pocatello? No, this really? is okay. no, this same, is same a, same little circuit. We it, we played the same room every I, weekend. It, it, so I I remember specifically that's where it was because every time I drive into town, I drive right past it and they demolished it a couple of years ago. But yeah, every time I used to drive into town. Anyway, so if you take a little bit of a walk, you can get to uh, 
There's a river. The river there that's... So Larry and I one day decided we were going to go fishing during the day while we had time to kill. We caught, it, we caught like this sucker that was like yay big. Yeah, I'm sure he was about that big. It was huge. <laughs> <laughs> No, seriously, no. It was fish, like, fish liar. Story right here. <laughs> no, no. It, 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 it was a sucker. Regardless. That's the thing. It was not an edible fish. Is what I'm getting. It was a no. big, ugly, nasty. Thing. So, <laughs> knowing the pets are going to be there the next week, I took the fish and just out of luck, Bert stayed in the same room I did, and I stuffed it in the pillowcase. And it, but and it had been like five days before they got there. And this is <laughs> bad. These are bad houses. Yeah, it, you could bleed. That's, that, that, that's like I said, like Rambler. Little, yeah, it's like it was. It, it was the most. And they come back. Bert's like, and I mean, you're the one who fucking did that, didn't you? And I'm like, fucking hey, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could because you knew who played the week you before. Kept, you. Yeah, you yeah. see their flyer, their set list on the stage. Yeah, yeah. You go into the bar and you say, "Oh, the pets are here next week. We need to do something." Like, caught that big ass fish, put it in the pellet, and for some reason, it didn't get changed. That's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> it was a band house, so what do you expect? You got to tell one of my favorite aerial stories from early, early in the beginning when you were tour up in uh, Washington. And you guys didn't have enough songs to fill a set list. And what are some of the tricks and oh, things yeah, you did no. to, to... Technical issues. Yes. The technical so, issues. yeah, we'd be short on material. You know, you were required, required to play, you know, a 45-minute set, maybe four of those through the night. And if you're coming up short, you know, you, you don't want to play... St we, were, we were still building our Too set list. Stuff over so what I, I would always just throw out something. We're going to take a short break. we got a little technical issue. And uh, of course, the light man was shut down, and I just meet my bass player over behind his cabinet, and we talk. And how you doing? <laughs> we act like we were fixing shit. <laughs> we hang out there for about ten minutes, and then we look at the clock. Okay, it's break time. Okay, we're gonna be right back. <laughs> But those are little techniques, things that you get through. And, and then you jump up and you, and you say, hey, uh, Johnny actually requested we play this song. Oh, again. no, oh, of There's course. No Johnny. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, there were names that we would use. Oh, so yeah. we would play those something in the first set, knowing yeah. that we were short in the last set. So we'd come up and play something that we wanted to play later, knowing that we were short on material. Yeah, we'd always make up some name set. like yeah. Homer Noodleman. <laughs> Homer Noodleman's here today. He wants to hear this request. I believe that was a character from the Hillbillies, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'd also do uh, Rosa Coletti. We're going to dedicate this to Rosa Coletti. We played it earlier, but we're going to play it again. That one was from Happy Days. <laughs> we're just making up shit from yeah, these 70s so sitcoms. But, you know, these are survival tactics, you know. Oh, you speaking of road stories... Spokane. What was the what was the bar there in Spokane? Gatsby's. Gatsby's. Oh my God, I love oh, like, Gatsby's. Okay. So Gatsby's. They, right down the street from Gatsby's, there was this hotel that they would put the bands in every time. Matter of fact, in this, there's nice a picture hotel. from there. Nice yeah, hotel. there's a picture from in there. So we decided one day we were gonna because the the thing in there was you'd go to that burger joint and get burgers. Dick's Burgers. Dick's you burgers. get a bag of dicks. Yep. Get a bag. <laughs> a Dick's so, and we, we were like, we'd well, already done famous. it for two, we, 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 we'd already done it two days <laughs> in a row. So we're like, fuck it, we're going to cook our own shit. So we went and bought steaks and stuff from, and we got the, uh, the, the, the grill thing, the hibachi up and going, and it just uh, smoked out the whole. You're in the room? You no, 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 no. Uh, outside on the fucking, <laughs> but we were on the balcony. Yeah, it, 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 burn that motherfucker down. <laughs> yeah. And the fire department showed up. <laughs> oh yeah, it, it gets yeah. you know that's normal though. There. Did you guys that's have to normal. cook on a hubcap after that? Oh uh, no, this is actually before that. This is a uh, back when we were still vamp. Back when Mark had just joined the band, we were playing a gig up in Rock Springs. And we decided to spend the day at, uh, at the, what's the dam in the reservoir? The Green River? The Green there? River, yeah. Up there, there in the dam and stuff. Well, we decided to, decided to spend the day, and we bought steaks and stuff, and we had nothing to cook them on. So me being Brilliant. who I am, being MacGyver, <laughs> we, we cooked, or we 
got the fire going, got it all good, and I peeled the hubcaps off my buddy's fucking uh, Cadillac. <laughs> Fucking threw them down there. We, we rinsed them out, of course, in the rivers, but still, that's, that's real, not... That is so MacGyver. <laughs> and, and the only thing we had to cut the, 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 the meat like, with was tin snips. It's like a wok. <laughs> yeah, seriously. That's right. Yeah. We had tin snips. That's all we had to cut it with. So, Brilliant. So, yeah, yeah we're like cake. cutting up fucking steaks in the hubcap. <laughs> that's a great I wonder how many years off my life I took off of that fucking one, <laughs> one MacGyver. You toss, you know, <laughs> toss it with a little marinade. <laughs> God, maybe fire. that's why my fucking kidneys are gone, right? <laughs> Not the beer. Hmm. So the most memorable one was uh, uh, with the early meat phase when uh, we were just a three-piece and uh, it was me, Dallas, and Mark Peterson. And, uh, you know, we we went up to Idaho. This was, this was a, just, it was a mini tour. You know, it's like a weekend tour. And it, it's really hard for local bands to uh, venture out you know especially you know there's not a there's not a big budget so um, uh, anyway uh, the biggest things I remember about that tour is whiskey shots at Denny's in the morning uh, loaded with extra eggs and hash browns and then uh, going back to the room and uh, coming out of the shower naked with a lampshade on my head, and that was it. So, I mean, that was good times, man. That place went away, and it became the Star Bar later on, and my band Kelly Rocks started playing there. And here's a fun memory of playing down there. One night, uh, they were, we were scheduled to play two nights, but they were ripping us off and we decided we wanted to go play somewhere else that night and they stole our equipment the <laughs> the club tried to hold it hostage to make us play there <laughs> crazy so back back in the old days we 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 never had even a an eighth of the crowd that we we pull now which is which is really kind of weird to us but um we had a we had a show at a place called Rafters, and some people may remember that place. <laughs> great bar, great bar, and uh, <laughs> we were playing there one night, and there was probably five or six older ladies, and they were super super drunk, and one of them really liked Frank. <laughs> no oh boy, and she came over. I could pop my teeth out, baby. She could barely stand. <laughs> She could barely even walk, and somehow she got up on the stage and sat down. And sat down. The security guy came over and looked at Frank. And said, "Do you want me to get her off of here?" And he's like, "Yeah." Yes. <laughs> so when she went to sit down, she kind of flopped down, and she went, "Oh my!" And she pissed her pants all yeah. over the oh, stage. Oh, Frank just immediately turned around and goes, "I can't believe this." <laughs> that's, 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 that's the strangest thing I, that's never happened and hopefully never <laughs> will again ever happens again i've had a lot of funny stuff you know with intoxicated people and things like that uh the in-stores with with slayer were epic uh we did one in it was at night um in 1995 and it was the day before their show. We did it at night, so they were at the shop. You know, I think it was after midnight, and uh, it was in the winter, so people had lit bonfires on the sidewalk. And, I mean, there was three thousand people lined up down the street around Granite Furniture, and um, I had to talk to the police a couple of times that night. You know, showing up, you can't have fires. <laughs> you know, so that's kind of kind of funny. Uh, I just had funny, you know, funny uh, like people come in. Like I had a guy come in. I don't know if you'll use this, but this is kind of, but he uh, was a store full of people and he was very intoxicated. He's leaning on the counter, you know, and he's, you know, knocking shit over like, you know, you got to get out of here. And he's like, you know who you look like? And I said, who do I look like? He was Sammy Hagar. I said, that's it. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so I, I went, I dragged him out, out of the, out of the store. People are laughing. But I got him out. I actually have a, 
like, you probably can't use this because I have a taser. <laughs> I didn't tase him, but I had it to just show him, like, mm-hmm. get the fuck out of here. I'm going to tase you. So I dragged him out. And of course, nobody's helping me either. Get him out there, and he's stumbling down the street, and he's like, he's like I got one of those, and I'll shock your neck. So you know somebody's probably tased him. So, <laughs> so shit like that. But yeah, you probably won't use that. Yeah, it's kind those of, are great stories. <laughs> ridiculous. Those are it's kind of a funny story. Uh, the craziest experience that I've ever had was uh, well, there's there's been quite a few actually, <laughs> and I could go on all night long. But uh, uh, first of all, speaking of back in the day, um, I I can't remember what the club was called at the time. I think it was called the Green Guinea. Uh, with my band Struck by Lightning in the mid-90s. Uh, you know, we show up to this club to play a show. And I, I mean, I think it was, I think it was on a Thursday night. I don't, I don't fucking remember. But, um, yeah, the owner, you know, pretty much notified us when we got there that, uh, hey, uh, just so you know, my girlfriend just killed herself in the bathroom. Okay. <laughs> and I'm just like, so do you guys still want to play? It's like, oh yeah, it's fine. So I don't know what the fuck went on with that, but that was kind of the the weirdest, creepiest thing that I've ever done. But uh, you know, over the years, you know, playing in clubs and bars, etc. Um, you know, you don't really know what to expect when you get there. You know, especially when you've got a lot of, you know, people drinking, et cetera, et cetera. Sure, you want everybody to have a good time, but, um, um, you know, it, it's kind of give and take with a band. Oh, God, I'm going to have to change names on this <laughs> to protect the guilty, uh, craziest road experiences. Well, getting to a hotel and being asked to remove ourselves before we had even checked in. Um, Why did that happen? I, I, I guess we just looked like we would cause trouble. Um, so we stayed in the hotel across the street. And about three o'clock in the morning, we went and hung out in the other one's pool. <laughs> so we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I'm gonna get somebody in trouble. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with with the Metallica story. <laughs> That's probably the craziest oh, on stage. This is on Kurt's personal level with what was it, Harlot? Show? Yeah, with Harlot. Oh, yeah, this one's a good one, you guys. So I don't I was, know. I this one's kind of uh, pretty dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> so I was on stage no. with my with my band Harlot, and we used to do the song "Knock It On Heaven's Door," and that's when I did my big long guitar solo, right in the middle of it. And I, like I said, I hate mentioning names because I hate slamming anybody, but this, honest to God, just happened. Okay. He, uh, Kirk Hammett walked up and grabbed my guitar and said, let me show you how a real guitar player does it. I'm pretty sure that was pretty close to what he said. That's what he meant, if that wasn't exactly what he said. And I just fucking lost it and just jumped back, grabbed my guitar, slammed him, his bodyguards grabbed him and hauled him out. And then later on, at the, after I got done with the solo, because it's our last song of the night, it, when we did that, um, James Hetfield came up and brought me a fifth of whiskey that he'd bought from the bar and was like, I'm so sorry. And from what I heard, Kirk hammond has been a killer guy since then, so I'd like to think I had some help in that, but <laughs> it, probably not. <laughs>Here's how much of a stud Tommy is. We're in Salt Lake City, and I bring these two girls on the bus, hoping to get something going. 
One of them sees Nikki and she's off to the other bus, chasing him around. Her friend is still with me and she says as soon as we're alone, I'm going to fuck you. I say, okay, do you want a drink? I hop off the bus to get a mixer and I see Tommy go up in there. I'm gone from the bus for maybe three minutes and by the time I get back in there, no one is around, but I hear something going down in the back room. I walk back there and the chick is standing on the couch, holding onto the roof of the bus while Tommy is behind her, just banging her. He was going so hard that the chick ripped the lighted panel out of the ceiling of the lounge. Mormon chicks are fucking insane. Yes, sir, they do. And, and, I don't know, Utah, Salt Lake, man, they've got some of the most beautiful women on the planet come out of Salt Lake. I don't know what they put in the water, but, yeah, Salt Lake's got some pretty ladies in it. Hell, hell, we had, we had fans. stow away in our equipment trailer to be able to see our show out of town. They, I, th- I, I want to say it was like three days they spent in the back of a trailer. Really? Yeah, and it was fucking cold. <laughs> I remember pulling in into the, into the show and when they opened up the, the equipment rig, these three guys come stumbling out of there. It's like, what the hell? <laughs> They've been peeing in bottles. <laughs> they, had, they had to have had, I don't know, a case and a half of beer to keep them happy for three days. But who the hell does that? But the fans were loyal. <laughs> that is awesome. So yeah, it was kind of cool. You know, that's the thing about Salt Lake City is all these, all these big bands, especially bands from the late 80s, like you know oh yeah salt lake city has the most beautiful women and maybe they say that in every town they go but i hear that a lot you know and i hear that not just from the 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 bands that come through town the national acts and and whatever but um uh, as far as being a local band you know um i guess i guess back in the day and i'm not talking way back in my day but I'm back in you know say the the early 2000s and all that stuff um, there was some opportunities there some I had to turn down and uh, you know but yeah I mean they were there I mean if you're a rock star you play guitar which a lot of you know I you know I, it's like Okay, you play guitar. So that's a that's a fucking extension of your. How do you reconcile, you know, the underground rock scene with the uh, predominant culture of Utah? Oh, that, well, again, that's a perfect example. Would have been the Randy Camp, you know, yeah, the fact that our boy say. wasn't even <laughs> old enough to play the bars yet. He was. And unfortunately, an equal part of, of the band wrote the songs, you know. Well, and, yeah, and he couldn't play in the bar because they knew who he was because of us and our background. They, you know, all of a sudden, there's this guy that looks like he's 12 years old standing <laughs> there. And, so he shreds. Was, and, 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 and then they found out, oh, he's my son, which everybody in the scene knew. So there was no getting around it. Dude, yeah. We could not we sneak, could him, sneak in. him in. We, we tried. couldn't get him a fake ID. We tried. We Tom Malone is up in Ogden. Kamikazes. He's yeah. like, who's this kid hiding in that dressing room? It's like, oh, you saw him? But I'll, I'll say you guys relate with the crowd and even the scene. Just We'll just talk about the prominent religion in the state. Yeah. I mean, you just have a song about a girl who, who was of that religion. Oh, of course. She, I've you know, seen it all. I've seen it all. Yep. That was a song we'd written for a gal, Sweetheart, Twyla. Yep. She um, danced down, uh, downtown at the, Lucky. Uh, Lucky was her stage name, yep. <laughs> uh, she danced at the uh, Barb Wire, barbed wire yep. and they had a little bar downstairs where the dancers would dance and then upstairs, it was a great venue, they had an elevator that would take you to, literally to the basement where the band would change, so it was such a great feeling yeah, going upstairs, so awesome. but yeah, while you're waiting for your show time, we're downstairs <laughs> get warming up a little bit. And and Lucky, was, the Lucky was one of the gals. I, it was weird for me because I had just turned 21. I'd never seen a dancer, a topless dancer. And I was just freaked out. But not only that, she was just cute as hell. She was very gorgeous. Sure. And so uh, I wrote a song about it called I've Seen It All. And 
Reason being is she had made it into Penthouse Magazine, I believe it was, Centerfold. Yeah. Yeah. Talked about her hit, her little little bit of background of her history or coming from Salt Lake City and I believe of the LDS or the Mormon faith. Yeah. So we were a little bit proud of that. Yeah. <laughs> Take it as you will, but it was kind of exciting. Hey, look, she's from would, would Utah. That be, would that be a good girl gone bad or a bad girl gone good? No, the, you know, <laughs> Salt Lake City's got beautiful women. And, and there's just, Everybody goes down their own path. I think your song actually kind of really relates to that. Absolutely. Yeah, takes their own no path. disrespect yeah. towards Absolutely. her. Absolutely. And I'd seen her years yeah. later in Las Vegas. And she was working still at the time, and but she was about to retire. She was ready. She had, had enough. She put, put herself through college or whatever she had done, bought her a home. But she still looked great, and you know it was Very fun nice. to tell her the story about the song that we'd written for her. And um, yeah, so again, a Utah girl makes it big in Penthouse magazine. We're proud. And, in that yeah. same vein. Um, I was going to, so uh, you've got like rock stars like Tommy Lee and the guy from Wasp and whatever, and other people are saying like, Utah's got the best groupies and everything else. Yep. I mean, is they, that, I mean, touring bands sure that love every coming city? to Is that every city? Or no, maybe? you know what, I, I honestly believe <laughs> that, no, I, that I, this I, is I, a favorite I, tour stop for a lot of those guys. Just, just, you know, and from you know. Where, where we go. You know, I've been married the whole time, been faithful, I've never cheated on my wife, and don't plan on it. <laughs> well, dude, but show, I have show seen... those pictures, bro. Yeah, Why would you? No, exactly. <laughs> but, so... You can see those on I've Metallic seen, records I've seen or something. Things. Like, we used to, every night after the bar, we would have these big parties oh that would last God. on until 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. Who, where are we partying tonight? Yeah, you, yeah, all these different places, and there was... Beautiful always ones. girls, always beautiful ones, and the bathroom doors was always I'm locked, and so were the bedroom doors always locked. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's no guessing what was going on. The Salt Lake girls are we definitely the best. That. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. And not only that, but they are the best. I can't tell you how many times where there's been, you know, a band member just doesn't have money to eat or get gas to go home. And girls going over and filling up their tank or buying them a meal or I mean yeah. it's all like girls are the best. But they always have been. But on the on the band's um, respects to, to you guys, it, it wasn't like the LA scene where you yeah. took advantage of them and never saw them. No, no, were, no we, we you, yeah, they knew where to find you. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is this, this, this is it. This yeah. is this Walmart is all like, this is Salt Lake City. There is no place that's twenty minutes away. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, they know exactly where you're gonna be next week. There's no ditch in that. So you have to show some love and respect. No, well, and, but it wasn't it wasn't hard because they made it easy for us. No, of course. <laughs> you the know? rock and roll industry loves the women involved and but yeah, I gotta think. Yes, Utah girls are the best. I mean, ultimately, chicks love rock stars. The famous Catholic nun and art historian Sister Wendy Beckett said it best: "There is no such thing as good art or bad art. There are only opinions." Translated to the music world, there is no such thing as good music or bad music. There are only opinions. The floodwaters of rock and roll filled the venues of Salt Lake City's past, and it has never subsided, regardless of world renown or not. Music thought lost to time, faded memories of fallen musicians, shine brightly among enthusiasts again like buried treasure brought to light, and a new generation of rock and roll beats strongly in the heart of our city. And to the young and raging of Utah who overflow with creativity, Never forget the immortal words of the great Lemmy Kilmister. People don't want to see the guy next door on the stage. They want to see a being from another planet. Now go. Be a fucking rock star. Get ready for some ass. Got a lot me. Utah, there's a place you should see. Jeeves and Cougars and Rockery. Most definitely. Scott Shepard in the hobby club and let me tell you about the life in his
Uh...